Herzlich willkommen hier aus Unterföhring, der Heimat von meinem Bowlingshop, äh, zu einer neuen Ausgabe unseres Livestreams. Und heute, wie wir schon auf Facebook äh, vorgestellt haben, haben wir einen Gast für euch. Daria Paschak ist heute bei uns. Ähm, hi Daria, how are you? Hi everyone, I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me on your live video. So we, at the moment we have plenty of guests. Um, I would just tell the people a little bit in, in German and then we, we start our conversation. Also der Julian wird wieder versuchen einiges zu übersetzen. Und ähm, wenn ihr Fragen habt, einfach in den Livestream reinschreiben und in den Chat. Und äh, ihr habt ja auch ein paar Fragen gestellt in Facebook, die werden wir auch alle durchgehen. Und jetzt werden wir uns eine schöne Zeit mit Daria widmen. So, Daria, how are you? How's life at the moment in this weird situation? The life is as good as it can be at this point. Um, Poland is almost almost fully locked down. We cannot even go for a walk outside or we cannot go for a run. So I'm trying to get the best out of the free time I have and just read books and it feels a bit different that I don't have any trips planned ahead. I think that I haven't been in that situation possibly in 10 years. So it's, it's something new for me and I'm getting used to it. So in Poland you can't even go out for a walk? Cannot. They're gonna they're gonna become less strict starting this Monday. But for the past uh, week, basically almost two weeks, uh, leaving the house could only happen under like if you really need it to. So it's groceries, pharmacy, doctor. Yeah, that's basically it. Church. You okay. couldn't just go out for a run. It wasn't allowed. And the fines were crazy high. We're talking about thousands of dollars just to go outside for a walk. Okay. If you get caught, then it's, it's really bad. So people are forced to stay home. Okay. So, uh, but in this situation, you normally, you live in the States, right? Uh, yes and no. I have moved to Poland in March. So, so not very long ago, but it's still, uh, nothing is still, nothing is sealed. Right now, I've been in Poland for over a month in my family house and I'm spending my time here. I'm unsure when I'm coming back to the States because of the whole situation, so hmm. I don't know. I don't know yet what's going to happen. Okay. So we have uh, plenty of guests at the moment. It's uh, 65 people watching and we have some first questions. Um, I would just say hello to Bianca, Sandro, Alex, Heidrun, Franzi, Maxi, Bettina, Thomas, Manfred, Ronny, Servus an alle. Und die erste Frage ist natürlich, wie soll es anders sein von Maximilian? So Maximilian asks, uh, what is uh, your biggest weakness from your uh, point of view on the lane? Can you please repeat? I don't know why the stream broke a little bit. What's the okay. biggest weakness? Yeah, that Just you think it, that you have on the lane. Uh, it's definitely trying to overpower the lanes. Many times I have lived, for many years I have lived under the idea that bowling is all about hooking the ball and that's before I knew any better, before I started competing internationally. So that instinct is still with me. So my biggest weakness is not being able to grind the games as well as the other girls. So nine spur, nine spur, nine spur gives me a bit of anxiety. I feel like, okay, I have to start striking. But on Tournaments where the, the conditions are hard, like PWBA, nine spur, nine spur, nine spur is actually very good. So it's about that, that, that you know, that the feeling that you have that, oh my God, I really want to start striking while it might not be the best time yet. Okay. I get patience. <laughs> Because we, we talked with Chris uh, in the last stream about you. Oh. Uh, yeah. We, you were a, a big uh, part of it. Uh, we talked because uh, he said, your biggest advantage is that you can open up the lane more than anybody else in the, in the PWBA. The problem is the lanes are too tough and you, you, you are forced to stay outside and cannot use the, the, your referee that you have actually. Yeah. I feel like many times people just jump into conclusions many times when it comes to my game being like, oh my God, you have the most referee, why you cannot score higher than the other girls that have less. The point is that many patterns have been forcing us to stay right, which means I cannot use my A game, which is mm. 
naturally creating lots of rev rate, going left to right. This is what I feel comfortable. It's not what I want because it looks cool. This is what I do best. I have to go into my B game where I have to start to roll the ball, throw it a bit faster, control my wrist. So it's very hard to outbeat and outscore Liz Johnson mm -hmm. playing the B game, being in her A zone, you know? Yep. It's, how do I, it's, it's all about just thinking of how you can make it better and and I'm still in the process I feel like the time I come when I'm going to start feeling comfortable um, in the different environments that is my best which I understand a lot of best players have to be able to bowl um, different ways when they're not feeling comfortable but many times I have been forced to play my B game, C game, D game for way too long, you know, you can trick it for a game or two, but you cannot trick it for 24 games straight. So yep. it's still something I have yet to figure out. Yeah, but it's uh, it's all about progress in the whole sport. I think you never start stop learning. I think yeah. even Barnes, who was like playing for like 50 years, still learning a lot. So um, a lot more viewers came in. Um, then Bernie says hello. Hey Daria, nice to see you. Good times. Know your parents. They played in Osnabrück on ESBT senior tour lots of times, but this year it wasn't possible. So I think they cancelled that event probably the last minute. It wasn't meant to. Be. I think it was meant to happen like in March. I yeah, think I it think was so. meant. To, yeah, in March and like. A week before the tournament, they were like, oh, we're not going. And I'm like, pa why are you not going? Okay, because I didn't realize how bad the situation was going to get worldwide. I was like, why are you not going? They're like, no, we're feeling it might be dangerous. Yep. Then Chris said, I met Daria in Orlando at Pro-Am. Pro Great bowler and even better person. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, then Meshup says, hi. Now I can see my bowling star live. <laughs> then Maxim <laughs> Maximian says, uh, what do you think about vacuum inserts? Do you play with inserts? Uh, yes, I do. And I've bowled. I really like that question because I've experienced with vacuum for most of my life. Now I just switched. So I think they're great. I do think they're great for... I've always had a hard time uh, with swallowing the fingers and they were shrinking because I was always traveling a lot, the, the pressure, and I was just so annoyed with changing those grips all the time. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the vacuum grips is something that would help me just just not having to change the grips all the time. But throughout the years, um, I have noticed that the vacuum grips wear, up, wear out much faster, which means that they just spread out a lot quicker. Yeah. So if I use one ball more often than the other ball, the grips are going to feel wider than they would in the other ball that I haven't used that much because the grips haven't stretched. So saying all that, being on a professional, a professional tour and I guess being a professional athlete just makes you think about all the smallest details of what you can do to become a better player, a better athlete. So getting out of the vacuum grips was something that I I thought was going to make me a better athlete because ball to ball to ball, I wouldn't have any difference because without vacuum, the, the grips are always the same. I guess they also wore out, but not as fast. So I would recommend it for people that fingers swell up a lot, that they're not bowling crazy much like I do when I'm in the season. I just asked my mom to convert to vacuum grips because her fingers also swell up a lot and she did it. She did it and she was very happy with it. So I do recommend it. However, from ball to ball to ball, I would consider just sticking with normal grips and not doing vacuum. Okay. Do you use uh, interchangeable thumbs or just regular no, I'm slots? Very, no, I'm very old school. I use molds. Okay. Um, I've gone to interchangeable thumbs twice. I'm on a turbo staff, so I've, uh, I've tried switch grip. And nothing against switch grip in general. I think it was more about the process that I really did not enjoy because being used to just not having to take the thumb up, put it in the different ball, and then if, what if you lose the thumb, what if you forget to pack it? 
I, I could not allow myself for this to happen for me. And because I'm a little bit all over the place sometimes, I could see myself just, you know, living for a tournament and leaving all my thumbs in the backpack somewhere in the house. Okay. I a lot more comfortable with uh, thumb molds, which means that they just thumb to thumb are exactly the same. And maybe for the drillers, sometimes it's a bit more, a bit more work to make sure the thumb is correct. But overall, I do mold and there's only maybe two other or three other girls on tour that I know that do mold. Everybody else is basically doing uh, interchangeable thumbs, whether it's vice or switch grip or ultimate. Yep. It's very common, very, very, very common. Okay, then uh, that's a pretty interesting question from Chris B. He says, is it uh, because of the tough patterns on PWBA, is it easier for you to play in the man PBA instead of the PWBA? Well, it's a very cool question. I've always thought so that when I was looking back in this course, on this course from the previous events, whenever I was bowling against men and there were other women in the field, I had a tendency to always finish as a high lady. So I would I'll beat a lot of other women that were playing in the field when I was competing with the guys. However, I still it was still very hard for me to make the cuts because I feel like just men score higher overall. I am very proud to say I made the US open cut for the guys on four different patterns. So I was very proud of this. And I made the World Series um, cut on Cheetahs. It was very cool. You get seventh, right? Yeah, that I did. It was close look, to the show. Yeah, it was really close, and I bowled really, really high game. Uh, but saying all that, I'm really not sure. I feel like when the lane man gives me an opportunity to play my A game, I'm very, very hard to outscore. Yep. That's what I think. So yep. I, I am put in that box, and I realize that, that I am in this easy conditions ball box that. Okay, not that accurate, a lot of rev rate, but if she strikes, she can strike forever. Yep. For, on some tournaments where the conditions were very easy. However, on the tough conditions, I just struggle. And I, I realize it, and I think I'm getting better. Yeah, you so are. So overall, I think the transitions with the PBA helped me a bit more than PWBA, but it's really hard to tell. But you already showed that you can win, so you you got your title. <laughs> it was almost so long ago that I can't I can't remember. But yeah, it was 2017, and it was really cool. So Ronnie asks, uh, what balls are your favorites at the moment? Wow, it's a very cool question because because I drew those balls right that right before the lockdown. I'm very anxious to go back on the lanes because I cannot wait to use them. And that's definitely the volatility, which is a very big ball with a massive core and, and very strong cover stock. It's an asymmetric ball. So it really blends the pattern very well. And as I mentioned, I really have a hard time for the ball to blend the pattern because I'm a type of a player that would get triple and then PBA washout and then Greek church type of reaction. Yeah. So I want to make sure that I have a ball that really slows down for me a lot and and volatility is definitely my favorite like okay. I love ball. the same type of a ball would be an ordinance solid which is a blue version um it's a symmetric ball it's a bit weaker so like I would use volatility for more oil and ordinance for a bit less oil and it's the same type of emotion that is very very controllable and it slows down in the right place what weight do you play 15s you play 15 so there, uh, we talked about last week also. Um, the, it was a huge thing with the two uh, two piece balls with the RGs and fourteen and fifteen and sixteen, RGs and differential. Uh, did you feel that? Uh, but you don't feel because fifteen were pretty good numbers, especially on the badgers. Mm -hmm. So well, I do feel the difference. If that's what, what you what you want me to what you want to ask me. Uh, the problem is that when I was rolling on PBA tour at some tournaments, and I would see Sam Cooley, who is a 900 level staff, and he was throwing the honey badger and the badger, and he was hooking the whole lane, and the ball was coming back. I'm like, how is he making this ball work? For me, this ball doesn't see. It just goes straight and misses the spot. So, of course, me, I would take that badger, honey badger, try to make a hook. So, exactly like... 
next morning I would realize some coolibos with 16s. Okay. And when it comes to badgers or honey badgers, it seems like it's two different balls. It seems yes. like they are just a lot stronger when they are 16, the differential is a lot higher and and it's very important to know who are you watching, who are you trying to book yeah. on some balls can be extremely, extremely different. Yeah, we had uh, uh, experience with the flux, with the orange one. I drilled a 15 mm -hmm. and a 16 for customer and they bowled and the, the ball was really good. Then the customer come in, okay, I want it in 14. He played and the ball was like, oh, totally different. Hook. Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. But they changed it now to three piece, right? Uh, I'm not that great on chorus. Okay. I think that the flux has a three piece that the flux pro, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'd rather don't, don't say anything about specifics of the ball. Okay, no I problem. just know it hooks enough or doesn't. <laughs> or whether it reads enough. It's more about full motion for me than the numbers because sometimes I realize that I get too caught up in the numbers and too much caught up in what I think the ball is going to do. That way I eliminate using that ball in certain patterns and sometimes that's not the best thing to do. Sometimes you gotta trust your eyes. Okay. So there's a pretty cool question from Thomas. He, uh, he asked, um, what was the best or most helpful that you learned on PWPA tour that you didn't know before? Oh, wow, that's like a very cool question to take like a minute and think about. No but worries. But it's definitely patience, you know, when, when you're young and you have a lot of dreams and you're going on something that of the world and and that everything should be working out for you. You feel like, wow, I achieved so much, everything should work. And then all of a sudden comes a disappointment. And that feeling of disappointment and trying to get out of it is something that I have learned. Um, the patience that, that it's just, it's a constant roller coaster. Um, the fact that at the end of the day, you do have lots of people that help you, but during the lonely flights, the, the train um, train rides, when you're in the car, you're all just by yourself stuck in your head. So there is nothing more important than the good self thoughts, the, the good self talks that you can have with yourself, because especially when you're on the slump and things are not going your way, it's just so easy to dig deeper and dig deeper into that feelings yep. of being lost. So the self, the good self talk, or just like trying not to speak negatively to yourself really helps because at the end of the day, the moments when you feel the most down, you are by yourself. Yep. And the friends can care for you and they, they're going to try to do everything that they can. But at the end of the day, you have to realize it's just you and you have to work it out by yourself. Yep. Me and it's teaching me every single day. Yeah, that's what I say when I have uh, students or something. At the end of the day, bowling comes you fighting against yourself. That's, 100%. Yeah. 100%. So I go to the first Facebook question we got. Uh, uh, what do you do in this, uh, say, down phases? How do you work with this? Do you have practices or something like this? There's a lot of different ways. I have hit a very long slump and sometimes people say like, oh, what do you do to get out of the slump? And those are league players that would just hit two bad weeks of bowling and be like, oh, I'm in a massive slump. Well, in fact, I faced a slump that was even like it was a, a year long. The year things were not going my way at all and I didn't know how to get out of it. So there's a lot of different ways. First, I would always try to pull it out. Team Mac has told me uh, a couple of months ago being like, Daria, if you have a problem in the relationship, do you work it through or you ignore and pretend like it's not there and you run away? So always the first thing I'm going to try to pull it out, to go as much as I can, to, to go back to the basics or watch old videos, take notes analyze, go obsessed about bowling and be like, oh my God, I really have to figure it out. And if that doesn't work, and I'm just starting to feel worse and worse, not just with my bowling game, but with myself and 
and just everything that is happening, if I feel like I cannot get the grit of of what's happening around me, I feel like the best thing is just to give it some time. Just okay. take time, relax. And that happened to me on the PWBA tour this past year where in the middle of a ball, uh, in the middle of a tour, I decided like I cannot do it anymore. I'm gonna go crazy. I'm I'm traveling, thinking bowling. I'm doing prams with the fans that are super lovely, and we're talking bowling. We're bowling. I'm coming home to my boyfriend that works in the bowling industry. We're talking bowling. I go practice. We're talking bowling. Like when is it gonna stop? I felt like my mind was spinning like crazy, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not bowling the next PWB. I'm going home for a week. I'm not taking my bowling balls. Yep. I took the next flight out in two days to Poland. I surprised my parents. I was with them for five, six or seven days. I came back to the next stop. I don't mean necessarily that the next stop I bowled, I, I bowled a lot better because I don't think I did. But I was so much fresher. I'm like, okay, well, it is what it is. Like, I have no expectations. Okay. So that healed my mindset. Cool. So a lot, a lot of questions come in. So... Uh, if you I just need to read the chat is a little bit bigger. Uh, what are your goals in the future? I've always said that I wanted to be that bowler that when you talk about is that the good one, the one that wins everything. That was always my goal to be the person that other competition competitors were like feeling it's like oh Darius in the field we might want to ball for a second place obviously this is not how it works in professional sports but <laughs> I want to be that competitor that everybody knew that no matter the circumstances I always somehow find a way to work it out and and yeah like obviously like the goals that would be specific would be to be a PWBA player of the year um, I give myself few more years uh, to achieve that goal. I would love to call myself a world champion one day. If I have a chance to bowl world championships again, I'm sure gonna give my best and maybe one day I can call myself a world champion. And that's it. That's when it comes to my goals and it's more about the process, I guess. That okay. is, it's just fun. But you already got the rookie of the year, so it's getting closer. Right, like the rookie of the year, I could only do, go for it once. Player of the year, I guess I have a chance every year. So yeah. we are on the right track, people. We are, we're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a, a question with WhatsApp uh, from a young player. And she she's asking, what way should a young girl bowling player choose um, Euro, you and... Uh, Verity Crawley and Diana are their idols and uh, how to get into the, the uh, professional bowling business as, as said in, in, as a professional bowler should she uh, left, leave the dream or how do how should she start just starting traveling or what? Yeah, I always believe you have to follow your dreams and you have to be quite um clear about what you want in life. I wasn't clear myself. I never dreamed about going on tour because there was no tour when I was bowling internationally. I just really, really loved bowling and I was bowling everything I could. It happened that the tour uh, started back up so I could go on tour. But the best thing is that really know your goals and what you want. Then try to practice so much that you feel like you are the sharpest that you've ever been. Try to talk to a lot of people that know a bit more than you. Um, try to get opinions from the coaches. Read a lot about bowling. There's so many videos about bowling on YouTube right now. Lots of guys are doing a very good job on YouTube, just spreading the, the word about bowling. Learn and get obsessed about it. Like make it the first thing that when you wake up, it's like, oh my God, I really want to go on tour. And once you get obsessed, there is going to be that one way you can figure it out for yourself of how to do it. Of course, one of the ways would be how, it, how it's going to go and then go back and then practice more, find a way of how to get better and then go back and go on tour. That would be the easiest way how to make it work, but I know it's not the same for everyone. So once we get really obsessed with something and we're looking for information from a lot of different sources, we start to see the path for ourselves, and this is not the path that somebody else can give you and be like, hey, this is how you have to do it. 
because <laughs> nobody has ever taught me or I guess a lot of other girls how to do it just happened because we got obsessed with the sport and if she's young enough I would definitely recommend trying to look into bowling colleges and, and bowl for college there's uh, some colleges that you can bowl on a scholarship and some of the colleges give you a full ride which means that you don't have to pay for school because you are a bowler for the team and there's a lot of different ways to do it. So once you get into it, I'm sure that like it's going to pop up and you're going to have an idea of what you have to do. Okay. So you worked a lot with Costas, right? And you, yes. And uh, would you recommend for a young player like like she is or uh, to to go to coaches like Costas or... Uh, yeah. It, I think Costas also don't do it for free. So you have to pay them, and, but that's okay. But... Uh, would you recommend it to do as many coaches as possible? Or I worked with Costa since I was, I guess, 14 or 15 until I left the state until I was 19. And if I have to say that there would be one coach that I would go back to, the one that I've worked with in Europe, it will always be Costa. I have so much faith in what he knows and how he understands the dynamics, but mostly he understand the personalities you know there are some coaches that are great because they know a lot but there are other coaches that are great because they understand people and they see what one is capable of doing and bowling is a sport when there is not set stone technique that everybody has to follow there is different ways to achieve the same results and i feel costas is so good in finding ways of how you should do this your way mm -hmm. but make it work so I would definitely recommend, and you don't need to see the coach every week, every two weeks. I was seeing Costas once a month, once every two months, and I felt like I was getting better. It's just about trying to, to really push yourself. And the most important thing when you practice and your biggest friend should always be a telephone and a tripod. Okay. Every time you have it right behind you, the way that you can see the angles, you work on something, straight swing. Take a video, you go through a shot, you sit down, you look at the video. You can be your own coach if you have a direction. So you don't need to have a coach behind you all the time. Yep. You get a lesson every If you understand the dynamics, the physics of, of where you're going, you can coach yourself on that particular element. And then once you get it down, then you can see the coach again. And I feel like Costas would be a great person to, to do that for many people. Okay, that's that's good to know because uh, I talked to him uh, a couple of times and we are looking for coaches here uh, a lot to bring them in to give the people something. And I will definitely go to Munich if you bring Costas in. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I would try. We we stay in it's, touch about this. <laughs> cool. It's eight hours drive for me, so it's really not that far. Yeah. So then we have another question. Um, Crispy ask, uh, are you involved in the ball production and ball testing at 900 Global? No. 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 I'm just told what balls are coming out. And the only thing that I'm involved in, something that people don't know, like uh, uh, faster than others, is what balls are coming out, what numbers, and uh, the video video and marketing of that particular ball. Many times I'm being asked for an opinion of what I think we're missing in the line or which balls have been more successful on tour than the others. Mm -hmm. I have never been involved into like, oh, I think you should tweak this score and make it that, or you should do this. I'm just the only person that has been pushing that. Please don't put so much white in the balls because white is not my best friend. But I've never been involved in, in production or manufacturing of a bowling ball or designing it. Okay. So, thank you. <laughs> I hope this uh, answers the questions. And uh, just for the people who are watching the stream, if you don't subscribe yet to our channel, please do. Just leave a comment and like the video. Marcel asks, uh, what is your opinion on the Brunswick Euro Challenge? Oh wow, I love this event. Okay. I love it always. I pulled it just once and I was really ready to go. Unfortunately, first it was postponed and then it was cancelled. So. So now it's already, uh, I think last week they, they cancelled it for this year. 
but I just got an email that it was cancelled. I'm really sad because it's I'm eight hours away from my uh, home study where I live in Poland, so I could pack bowling balls, pack my parents, pack my friends, and go into the tournament. And I really like it. The only thing that irritated me the last time I bowled, and it's going to be a bit different from what I said before, is that the lane condition just happened to be so easy that I was getting very aggravated each and every time I didn't strike because the scoring pace was crazy high. Yep. And it wasn't last year, it was, I think, about two years. Yep. What it took to make the cut. And despite that fact, I liked everything about that event. Okay. Did, did you play the Euro Challenge when it was in Paris? No. You just played? I haven't bought... Yeah, I haven't bought many EBTs or World Bowling Tour events because first I was in the States in the school, which I couldn't do it. I couldn't fly into all those events and then I went on tour and there's visa issues in that sense. I couldn't just like leave the country and come in every time I wanted because many times I was grounded waiting for the reply. So I just started bowling more, more events two years ago a little bit and last year a lot more than I have ever been before. Okay. So, EB Overtime ask, what's your pre-shot routine? Oh wow, I love my pre-shot routine. I love thinking about it because it gives me the only sense of, um, like, the sense that I have something under control, you know. Bowling can annoy you so much because you cannot control whether the ball is going to strike or you're, or you're going to just leave a split. But the pre-shot routine is like mine. I get up when my name... Um, when my name pops out, uh, it's my turn, I get up, I get my rosing bag, I play with it, I put it down, I wipe my ball, I put the ball in the left hand, I play with the rosing bag. Many times when I'm not feeling very well, I will, you would see me swinging the arm a few times with still holding the ball in my left arm. I would look exactly where I want the ball to go. And it's not the arrows, it's not the break point. Many times I would look exactly at the focal point, which is the direction that you're trying to give to the ball. So it, it tends to be a, a bit farther to the right at your break point. And, and then and I try to set up and then I visualize the show again, I take a breath and I go. And I love it. And I feel like everybody should have a pre-show routine because it's very important. And a lot of people think that they're better than they are. They don't need to do those things because they're boring. And that I was one of these people that was always like, oh, pre-show sure routine. Oh, like you're too picky. I can just go up and strike. No. If you want to get better with something, you have to be very particular about the things you're doing off and on the lanes. And the pre-show sure routine is the easiest way to become a better player. Okay. More. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I understand. I hopefully uh, over time understand it's also. So I would just tell the people a little quick in German, so don't be scared with the different language. Also, um, vielen Dank Maximilian für deine Spende in unserem Stream. Das ist übrigens ähm, die erste in einem Live-Chat. Wir haben einige Spenden schon erhalten auf unser PayPal-Konto. Den Link findet ihr dann unten in der Beschreibung. Ich möchte mich bei allen schon mal bedanken, die das gemacht haben. Ihr seid toll. Ich finde das super. Und äh, danke für die Unterstützung. Wenn ihr äh, Interesse daran habt, könnt ihr gerne unten in der Beschreibung findet ihr einen Link oder ihr könnt es hier in dem Chat machen. Aber auf jeden Fall vielen, vielen Dank für die Unterstützung und das freut uns sehr. Wenn ihr unseren Kanal abonnieren wollt, könnt ihr es gerne tun. Lasst ein Gefällt mir da. Am besten, wenn ihr wollt, könnt ihr gerne am Ende des Streams, wenn das Video online ist, drunter noch einen Kommentar lassen. Das hilft uns sehr, weil YouTube dann uns besser rankt. Dankeschön. So. We get back to Daria. <laughs> Daria Pajak is our guest today, uh, a PWA professional in, on the bowling tour in the United States. And Maximilian asked a question. Um, I must read it in German first. Um, in July, you did a 10 pin challenge where you have to hit two times in a row the 10 pin. How long did, does it take? To make it and how frustrated you've been forever <laughs> it was the worst challenge i ever came up in my life and i think i regret it up to this day it took me i guess like 45 minutes an hour but i'm talking about constantly bowling but what, 
shot after the shot until I got it two times in a row. And I thought I was gonna die. I thought that I was gonna burn this place down. I was kicking the ball return. I was getting so angry with myself. I couldn't understand. I was getting frustration. And that's why on the other side, I was doing it because I could I walk some feelings that I've never had during the practice. I've never felt so frustrated in my life as I had that day when John Janov at JJ was like, oh, can you get that tenth and clean? I will forever remember that day. I think it's a very good exercise, not just for your form to get everything in the line. It's more mental. If you struggle as much as I do, because I had Jason Belmonte send me a video that really, really got me so mad. He was like, oh, this video is for Daria. And then he goes and he gets the tenth and clean and he comes back and he, he goes, oh, one, now let's go for two. And he gets it clean for a second time. And, and he's like, I don't know what you found so difficult. I'm like, come on. Don't do that to me. So the, what I went through, okay? So the so challenge I, pretty much was to hit the 10 pin clean out of the full rack twice in a row. Straight. So we're talking up to first or second board. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think that's very important information because that was not across the lane. You had to throw it dead straight. Okay, so first, second so, board straight. Yeah, and it was very important not to back up the ball. Okay. So you couldn't just give some angle from left to right. It had to be dead straight. And it was very difficult, but I wouldn't have done... It's like, everybody can do it. You just have to keep trying. I'm like, yep. okay, I will try. So and practice. It was very cool. <laughs> yeah. So... Thomas asks, who are your idols, male or female? And by the way, her style is awesome to watch, already better than the most males on the power level. Thank you. Very kind. Um, my idol has always been, and I think always will be, Jason Belmonte, because uh, he was the very first professional I've ever met. And I was really young, and thanks to him, my dad converted to two hands. And he's my idol, not just when it comes to how great of a bowler he is, but how great of an ambassador of the sport he is and how much he's trying. So for that reason, he is always going to be my idol and the person that I admire. Um, on the girl side, it would, right now that I'm on tour, I realize that a lot of women are a lot better than I thought before that they were because now we practice, we go in the same environment. I understand how great they are. And that would be Liz Johnson and Karen Darren Barrett. But before, I went on tour it always been Kelly Kulik because I just admire it of okay. how she can do so many things with her hands, a lot of things that she was doing. Okay. So then I have a question here where WhatsApp came in. Was it hard for you to left, leave Poland to the States? Extremely. Extremely hard. It was it wasn't last minute because I knew I was going to go to the States. But you know when you're in high school and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go to the States to do college. I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah, of course. And when the time came, I was like, Dad, I'm, I'm not going to go to start this semester. I'm going to go next semester. And he's like, no, no, no. Either you go now or you don't go at all. So I'm like, okay, I guess I have to go now. So I ended up being the last person to be admitted to Weber International that year because I did everything last minute. And it was extremely hard. Because of the language barrier, I didn't understand a lot of things that were being told to me. I didn't understand the regime of practices. I've never been a part of such a big team. I I was lost. I was like kid in the clouds. I, I, I thought I was a good bowler because I had won so many tournaments in Poland and I have some medals and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm just shit. I'm not bad. And I go in and they tell me I have to practice for three hours. I'm like, three hours? You're crazy. Like three hours doing what? <laughs> like what you do and then i was sore and i was always hungry and then uh the, the bad food in the states made me put on weight and then i was trying to lose that way and and it was a spiral of just what seems a very hard transition but i think that really hardened me as a person like i feel like i if i did this at such an age now i can go anywhere Send me to Asia to survive for five weeks. I'm gonna do it, <laughs> no problem. Okay. I can go anywhere now. And uh, so it was hard. when uh, young players or, or girl or man, it doesn't matter, have the goal to go to Weber or something like this, how can they? What do you do the whole day? How does it work? What is the uh, schedule? 
So this is like being, it's called being a college athlete. And if somebody really wants to know, it's really hard to find videos on YouTube about bowlers, but you're gonna see uh, videos of runners, baseball players, basketball players, they just show you the whole day. And bowling is just the same. fitness coach, the bowling was the most strict process factor. So I would wake up at 7 and 7.15 or whatever I had first class, then I had a window of two hours when I had to do individual practice workout in the gym, I go to the gym, shower, I would finish the school at 3.15 p.m. At 4.30 we started a team practice uh, that would last two to three hours around 8 p.m. We had dinner on campus and after that we were either free to go or we had a workout that we had to attend but that would depend on the day it usually the structure right now in Weber and my last three years that I remember was practice with the team every day from Monday to Friday uh, Saturday Sundays were usually tournaments when we're flying to different states um, we will have to show up uh, two days for individual bowling practice. So on the top of having to be there at 4 p.m. for team practice, we had to show up wherever we had a window uh, during the day and pick two days that we wanted to go. And we had to do two individual bowling practices. We will have a team workout once a week on Wednesdays. Plus we will have to go to the gym twice on our own when they will check the presence. And if you don't show up, then you're being punished and you don't want to get punished because that usually means you have to wake up at 5 a.m. and just run around Kegel Training Center and you don't want to do that. So it was very busy. It was very hectic. It felt like you didn't have time to breathe because at the end when you had a weekend to breathe a little bit, there were troubles when you had to wake up at 4 a.m. and fly to different states. And that's why the first year I feel like it was so hard for me because it was very overwhelming but it was so rewarding because you felt like you were doing something for yourself you felt okay. like ah, i'm doing it so that's how it looked like and uh after you left the, the college um how often do you train after that was it what, uh, did you miss something did you train less or more or? well i feel like after four years being on the team i was i don't want to make it sound bad i wasn't fed up but I was very looking forward to both practice on my own and not have such a... I was, I was given the freedom that I haven't had for the past four years when I was in college. So I didn't practice less, I practiced probably just as much because when I graduated from Weber, there was that rule to where for every Weber graduate, you could come into Kegel Training Center and practice for free. It doesn't mean with the coach, it just means that if you had, if there were free lanes that you can practice, you could practice. So I was taking advantage of it. I was working as a bartender in um, one of the restaurant chains in the same city and mm -hmm. I was practicing. I was starting to go more and more and next year I went on tour. Okay, and how much do you practice now? And not now because everything is closed, but normally? <laughs> I try to practice every day, but I think it ends up being like, I'm bowling six days a week. Six days a week and then you'd like two hours or something per day? I would say from hour to two hours. Okay, and then six, six days a week. Say. Yeah. Sometimes I'm for two and a half hours but you would see me sitting back for 45 minutes not being able to motivate myself okay but purely bowling is an hour from an hour to two hours i think it's a very good time and there's a question uh regina and robert asking uh when you practice on the lanes are you also practicing mental and strength and uh what is it the opposite of strength is so weaknesses no, no, not weakness. Uh, your endurance. So you, your, your uh, you saw so your strength, your endurance, and your mental game. How do you practice this? Well, when I bowl, I don't practice on strength, neither on on endurance, because this is something that is a backbone of your bowling, and that backbone is being trained in the gym uh, or any other physical activity. You're not gonna build up strength on bowling. You have to be strong enough to be able to bow a certain way or be able to to last and have the endurance. But mm -hmm. by bowling out, you're not going to really have a lot of endurance because it's a lot easier to just go for a run and build endurance that way. So when I bow, I work on my mental game, I work on my physical game, and I work on um, 
ball motion, reading the lanes, uh, you know, the mental, which means the frustrations with the practices. And mostly it's just making myself practice. Sometimes it's really hard because if we have to practice every day, the same thing, it gets boring. So yep. you have to be mentally strong to push yourself the same way as an athlete is on a treadmill when he doesn't want to run. Uh, mentally, he has to push himself. And this is how some of the bowlers feel. And that's how I feel sometimes. And I'm sure some other professionals feel the same. Okay. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, as, as we said before, it's more like uh, fighting against yourself and uh, the mental training is more winning against yourself. <laughs> Definitely. So here's a pretty interesting question from Sebastian. He's asking, what do you think? Why is 200 bowling style in women competition not so strong compared to men 200? There are not a lot of, mm -hmm. there are not of, uh, lot of women uh, playing two-handed at the moment on tour, right? There's nobody on tour. But I really don't like the statement when people say, oh, there's no 200 girls in the world. I'm like, in the world? You've seen the whole world and you're telling me there's none? I'm no, getting very on, aggravated. But on tour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I understood your question. I know you were saying on tour. I don't know why is that. I feel like the girls might not be able to develop enough power or strength to be able to bowl two-handed. I personally suck two-handed. I don't know how to bowl two-handed. Um, but bowling two-handed is, is really hard and you have to be very accurate. I think there hasn't been or hadn't been a girl that was born and was bowling two-handed all her life and now she's 18, 19, 20 and she can go on tour. Once this yeah. player is born, where she's committed to both two-handed and she's going to be training like a two-hander and understanding the game and everything about it, that girl is going to be overtaking the PWBA tour. But I think the two-handed style is still too new yep. for a girl to be able to develop because a lot of people that convert into two-handed styles have already lost so many years and it's impossible to catch up to catch up to ball on the most professional level on the highest level in our sport yep i understand that um regina asks, um how is your ball um how to say your 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 how's your back looking at the moment have you more different balls or do you use uh one single ball and then making three different layouts on this ball. For example, the, the volatility, do you drill one of it or do you drill three with three different layouts and, and uh, stack with the balls you like? I drilled only one because I plan to drill another one, but then the pandemic happened, so I couldn't. It depends. It really depends because I love a ball that is called Dream On. It's a very old bowling ball and I have drilled. I have six of them and five of them are drilled exactly the same way because when I experimented and tried to this, to have this ball with different layouts, nothing worked. The only my favorite layout ball was on that ball and with a lot of different layouts like pin up and pin down or very short pin. But there are some balls that just just match up to your game with that one particular layout. So it's it really depends, you know. I'm never going to try to make a ball that is meant to be a very long and very snappy ball. I'm never going to try to make it a very early. and It's just whatever the specs tells that the ball should be. I usually try to drill it that way first as my benchmark layout. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then if you see a potential like, oh, maybe that could be good for this, then I would experiment. Okay. But usually tend to have to the same bowling balls because if that cover stock doesn't match the, the surface I'm bowling on it doesn't matter what layout I have that cover stock or that core doesn't match it's done so if I had six balls but I have two or three the same ones from six balls I'm ending up with three or four bowling balls and many times I cannot afford to do that did you feel a difference between the first dream one and the second one I never drew the second one okay <laughs> I never have because I love my dream on so much and I stocked up on them so I felt like I didn't need, I didn't have any to do a second one, the second edition. But from what I have heard and what I have seen, uh, they were different. The, the second Ramon was a lot flatter and a lot rollier. 
so opposed to the first one. The second one could be used on shorter patterns, on the patterns when you need control in the back because it would just flatten out so much in the back. Uh, well, the first one was exactly opposite. It was very strong in the back and it was loopy. It wasn't sharp, a hockey stick kind of emotion. Yep. So Arthur Novak, hello and greetings from Poland for you, visitors, and of course, especially for Daria. Thank you. Um, Chris Solano asks, heard any news on possible time frame for return to PWBA? I have heard the news, which are not very good. I was watching the USBC video live stream, I think it was two days ago or three days ago, and Chad had said that if he had to, make a decision right now about the PWBA tour, he would have to cancel it. But because he doesn't have to make a decision right this moment, that's why it's being postponed. But nobody knows when it's going to yeah. get back up. The only good thing for us professionals, for those who like to watch professionals as well, is that it's being postponed, not cancelled. Because once it's cancelled, then we have nothing to bold this year when it comes to professional tour. Yeah, and nothing to win and everything. That's uh, that's pretty tough, I think, especially in uh, when you are. It's in every sport right now. When you're a professional athlete, it doesn't matter if you're playing bowling, tennis, or whatever. You have no income. When you when you don't win, can win any tournaments. You just have the income from your sponsors. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I'm sorry. It was. It, I lost you for a second. No problem. When you were so, saying. Income. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter what sports, if it's tennis, golf, uh, whatever, when you have no income or no uh, light at the end of the tunnel that you can get income soon without any sponsors, you have no chance. That's pretty hard. Yeah, yeah it is. And I think that economy is going to get a very hard hit all across sports, leisure, Everything the economy is just. I hope everybody, everybody who is suffering because of this pandemic, is gonna just get back up once they can, and life can slowly get back to normal. Because right now it's not looking very great. Yep, we have to. We all have to support smaller businesses and uh, go there and show up when all is finished and get this working again. Simon asks, uh, "How do you start bowling? How do, how does it come that you play bowling?" Because your father is, I think, is bodybuilder or was bodybuilder. Yeah, he used to be. And uh, so you're not like a, you come into bowling because of your family. You just started or? Well, the first bowling center was built in 99 in Poland. So I was six at the time. And it happened that this bowling center was built in the biggest gym facility in the area, which was 100 kilometers away from my hometown. And that was the gym that my dad would go like once a month or so. And he was like, hey, they're building this bowling center. And there was a kid in the back seat of the car. And I'm like, what's bowling center? And he's like, you know, you have like those pins and like a big heavy bowling ball and you have to knock them out. And I remember, and it's crazy. I was so small. I still remember when I couldn't comprehend it. Like I didn't understand. I've never seen bowling in my life. I've never seen it on mm -hmm. TV, nowhere, not even in cartoons then. And we walked in and it was light and it was cold and it was cold and I fell in love and we slowly started to bowl in the leagues, we started to, we slowly started to to come more often and then um, I think it was two years later they opened a bowling center in my hometown where I was basically practicing all the time. I was lucky to win my first event when I was 10 or 11 years old and then one of the coaches had seen me and he's like, Daria, I think you can be a good player, I'm going to teach you something. So I had lessons with him, uh, we were doing lots of drills, he was the one that taught me that you have to do drills and and at the end our work hasn't finished um, the right way, uh, but he was the coach that had showed me that bowling is a sport that you can practice it just like any other sport that there are drills and I'm, I will be always thankful for that. Yep. And that's how I heard it. Cool. That's cool. Natalie asks, uh, do you coach somebody or would you if you can? Oh, the cat. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. So I ask a question, uh, do you coach somebody or would you if you can? 
Yes, I do actually coach. I I don't coach very many people, or I haven't been doing it for many many months or many years. I've always coached my mom, and my mom is a very good student. Uh, she really trusts me, which is very lovely. But when I used to live in San Antonio, I was coaching a very cool group of people. They were on one team, and I had a few lessons with them, and they did very amazing after our lessons. I think overall, I maybe practiced with. 20, 25 people. It hasn't been um, a type of sessions where I would practice with them for like a year, every like two, three, four weeks. Mm -hmm. I had just a couple of lessons and I truly enjoy it, but it's very hard on me in that way that it really drains me. So if I have three practices one day with other people, I'm not capable of staying by myself and practicing because I spend so much energy analyzing their game and, and watching and trying to help out but I'm not able to practice my own game so I'm trying to balance it out um, I would love to one day to coach and to, to help out but for now I'm trying mostly to, to focus on my own bowling and and coach if I really have time and if somebody is really really uh, trusty in me because that's also very important and maybe one day I'm gonna do some certificate and, and just become a very good coach yep I, I I have I met the same experience with uh, when you coach other people, it's getting really really hard to coach yourself or practice. Almost impossible. Yeah. Because. No that's true. So Maximilian asks, what is uh, the best thing to be a professional bowler? That hmm. a lifestyle that. I don't know if I would get if I was doing any other sport because I don't know if there is any other sport that makes you travel so much. And when I mean so much, I I have flown over a hundred flights last year, a hundred segments. And it's a good and a bad thing, but it's the lifestyle where you're constantly moving. And when you're constantly moving, you're constantly meeting your friends that you haven't seen in, in many, many years or many months maybe, or you're visiting the places and you come back to the same places after a year or two, is the constant um, travel, it's a constant move, it's just living on the move. And this is amazing about being a professional bowler, despite the fact that you bowl because you love to and, and you bowl and you get paid for it and you bowl. I start out that not many people can handle well because some people just like to be at home and and have kind of settled lifestyle. But for those who like to see new places, meet new people, make new connections, bowling is great. Okay, yeah, I think so too. That's that's pretty much awesome in, in bowling that you're you're seeing so many places, you're seeing so many people. That's an awesome thing in bowling. What's different than other sports? When you are like a soccer player, you play home and you play away and that's it. But in bowling, you're traveling worldwide. It's it's pretty much like tennis. I think tennis is pretty yeah, close. I think, yeah, but I don't think they travel just as much. Yeah, they stay longer. They stay in longer and I think that their schedule is more one tournament focus opposed to a swing focus. Yep. So like... For they prepare for that event, they travel, they set tool, they take time, then they play the event, then they rest. For us, it's crazy. It's one tournament is done, we're already taking a fight for another one. A different state, sometimes a different country. But yeah. I love it. I really love it. And there's a question on Facebook we got. Um, how do you prepare for a huge tournament? It uh, depends. When it's like US Open, when it's really important for you? I mean, the... the the very last preparation is always going to be the equipment. You always want to make sure that you have all the different shapes in your bag so the lane conditions are not going to surprise you. That if it's a short pattern, you're going to have urethane. If it's a long pattern, you're going to have something that's going to be a higher RG. So that's the very last thing that you always have to prepare very well. So those basics that you, your backpack has everything that you need. So when you're under pressure and you need a skin patch, you're not going to freak out that you don't have. So those little things are very important. But when it comes to practices, there's not much you can do a week or two weeks before the practice. Usually what you've got, that's what you have. And there's nothing to change it. You have to calm down. Take it easy. The spares, the, the basic things before the tournaments are very important. However, if 
I'm preparing for the tour, which I know it's gonna start, let's say, April 15th, right? Mm -hmm. It was meant to start April 15th. I'm gonna make myself a whole regime of practices, and we're not talking about a week or two before the tour. We're gonna talk about a month, two or three months. So I'm gonna really like, if we were in February, February would be my month where I will be changing my physical game and doing things to tweak my game. I'm going to feel very uncomfortable and I'm going to really practice a lot, a lot, a lot. And then March, I will try to work on different things. And then as that April will be approaching, I will slow down on changes, have what I have, uh, practice a lot less and focus a lot more on the spare shooting and the bowling balls on my equipment. Because... <clears throat> But you cannot fix your timing two weeks before the tour. So there's yeah. no point to do it because then you're just going to stress too much over it. So there is two different approaches, whether you have, you know, three months or two months for preparation for a big event or you have a week or a few days. It's always going to come down to practicing on your spares, taking it easy before the tournament, not to overwork yourself and to pack your bag accordingly and have a very good equipment in your bag. Yeah. So you can only control the things that you can control. Okay, that's uh, that's cool. Um, so I just uh, say something in German. Also vielen Dank für alle, die uns unterstützen auch, wollte ich nochmal sagen. Uh, wir sind ja heute hier mit um, Daria Payak und wir reden mit ihr drüber. Wenn ihr natürlich wollt, könnt ihr gerne unseren Kanal abonnieren. Liken nicht vergessen und wenn ihr uns einen Gefallen tut, dann wartet ihr bis nach dem Stream und kommentiert unser Video danach. Das hilft uns sehr bei der YouTube-Suche. So, uh, I prepared some uh, quick questions for you. I, I also did, uh, I just bring it in the la two streams ago. So I started and I asked them anybody. So it's just, what's your favorite food? Asian, so Japanese, Chinese, I love that. <laughs> okay, your favorite beverage? Gin and tonic. Gin tonic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love Coke Zero, all right? Coke this Zero, is okay. my So what's your biggest win? A PWBA title, so PWBA Detroit Open. What's your biggest fail? US Open Finals against Liz Johnson. Okay. If you had one billion dollar, what would you do? I would build a massive, massive bowling center and I would I would hire the best coaches in the world. I would I would get houses for them, I would make them move in and we would split the bowling center into the different parts of different coaching stations and I would have them work on anybody that flies in. And for anybody that would be practicing in my bowling center, they would have accommodation for free because I would be rich and I could accommodate them. Okay. And I would just bowling big. That's cool. Uh, your idol in the youth. In the youth, meaning when I was youth? Yeah. Yeah, Jason Vermonti. So, yeah. So idol now, you said before. Uh, your biggest supporter? My parents, my dad, my mom. Uh, best buddy on tour? Diana and Verity. Okay. Favorite sport beside bowling? No. None? Oh, I think the stream stopped. Oh, but I don't follow any other sports. Okay. Like, I, I don't follow tennis, so I don't know the next tournament. Okay. Um, the last one. Uh, what would you do different if you could start your bowling career again? I think I wouldn't do anything different. I would focus more on knowledge and learning about the equipment and stop thinking that bowling is about hooking the ball. But I guess everything I'm going to help me get where I am. So That's I cool. would just try to get more information. That's what I would do different. Okay. Then uh, Francisca asks. That's now the quick ones are done. Thank you for that. So now uh, Francisca asks, what was her dream job in the childhood? Did she want to become a professional bowler or did she have other plans at first? I never had any dreams as a child. I never wanted to be a princess. I never wanted to be, I don't know who I could be at the time. 
I always knew I loved bowling, and I never associated my future with it. I just, I like to say I go with the flow. If it's flowing for me, I'm going to go with it. And bowling has been flowing ever since I started to bowl. So when I knew I could go to college, I went to college. I My major is in hospitality, which means that I could be working in restaurants, ho hotels, or theme parks. Because I really like um, talking with people and helping them out. So that's something that... I could do it not bowling, but I've never had plans to become a professional bowler or I neither had plans to to have my own hotel. I just okay. Yeah. You're just you. That's okay. Not what I like and I try <laughs> to work without really having a plan. Yeah. Um so actually we are now pretty much one hour and five minutes in. Um do you want to tell our viewers something that you want to tell them? Yeah, I wanted to say that thank you for watching and thanks for being with us and asking questions. I wanted to ask you to subscribe to the channel and if you liked the video to, to click the like button because I am on that side that I also manage my own social media and I know how much it helps to just help bowling grow and um, people like you um, are helping to, to make it grow by passing on information to the out other outlets that maybe possibly I couldn't reach myself. So I'm very thankful for people like you that just do that. We and will, We will put the link in the description for your Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, and, and yeah, guys, bowl on. Bowling is a sport like all the other ones. And if you really hit a slump, just try to, to think, am I doing too little or too much? If you're doing too much, back up. For a little bit, if you're doing too little and you know you can do a bit more, just do twice as much. <clears throat> cool. Thank you very much for your sp statement. So, again, Daria, thank you very much for being our guest in our show. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for this uh, cool interview for your for this cool stream. And uh, we really appreciate it. I hope the, the people watching like the stream and uh, I hope we see us soon here in Munich or somewhere in the world and I I really hope that you get uh, your dreams done in PWBA and uh, be the greatest bowler of all time. So, I hope so. <laughs> so thank you very much and uh, yeah, be healthy, stay healthy and uh, say hello to your dad. Sam, I will say hello. Thank you. I will see you soon. I hope so. Okay. Then, thank Bye you very guys. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So, liebe Leute, ich bedanke mich bei euch, dass ihr unserem Stream zugeschaut habt und wer natürlich möchte, kann unseren Kanal unten abonnieren, die Glocke drücken, damit ihr kein Video mehr verpasst und wenn ihr wollt, Könnt ihr auch gerne einen Kommentar da lassen. Das hilft uns sehr, wenn dieser Stream beendet ist. Also, ich wünsche euch eine schöne Zeit. Wir sehen uns am Dienstag um 19 Uhr zum nächsten Stream. Bis dahin. Tschüss.